They claim the soul Bible has outlived its day. That there are some changes that need to be made. Let no man deceive your Bibles or turn with me to Matthew 24. Truth is determined by the test of time. Does the old Bible the things and bounds? Never mind those people who won't throw it out. Churches are shifting and falling away. We need to so book more than ever today. with the Bible and written it anew. Nothing is sacred, oh what will the children do? Our way of life is changing and people don't care. The signs of the end we seen everywhere. Trust the old Bible with its thieves and mouths. Never mind those people who want to throw it out. Churches are drifting and falling away. We need the soul book more than ever today. They've criticized, maligned it, and slandered it too. Some say it's inferior and simply will not do. They've tried to replace it and shove it aside. But God is its soft, He said it will abide. Trust the old Bible with its thieves and vows. Never mind those people who won't throw it out. Churches are drifting and falling. is coming to judge and decide He will determine whose heart is right The Bible is sacred holy and grand And those who defile it Oh where will they stand Trust the old Bible Welcome to Empty Cross Ministries Wednesday Bible Study. I'm Brother David. The name of the program is King James Version Exposed. Because we use the King James Version, we look at the verses, break them down, bring them to life, and expose the meaning. Today we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Before we get to that, I want to Read Psalm 103, verses 1 through 14, as kind of a devotional reading for us. Psalm 103, beginning, beginning in verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine inequities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us 
according to our inequities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. <clears throat> Once again, our scripture for today is Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the entire scripture first, then we're going to go back and look at each verse and break it down or bring it to life. <clears throat> excuse me, and expose the meaning of that particular verse. I've titled uh, tonight's episode, Called in Authority. <clears throat> Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, beginning in verse 1. Once again, I am reading from the King James Version. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house, <clears throat> Excuse me. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not much, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there, and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why, re why reason ye these things in your heart? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he rose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Our key verse is verse 9. Whether it is whether is it easier to say to the sick of palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. Put our co lesson in some context here. The Gospel of Mark is a book of action. After an introduction of only three verses, the record begins with, J John did baptize and preach. We see that Mark chapter 1 verse 4. Jesus continued to be on the move. We see that in uh, verses chapter 1 verses 9, 12, and 14. While the other three gospels, while the other three gospels often slow down the action, Mark moves right along with his condensed style. Mark chapter 2 verses 1 through 12. Tonight's text is parallel to quite similar accounts in Matthew chapter 9 verses 1 through 8 and Luke chapter 5 verses 17 through 26. Although the chronological order of events varies in the three synoptic gospels, all three locate the scene in Capernaum during Jesus' initial ministry in Galilee. According to the passage just prior, a man with leprosy had come to Jesus and pled with him to be made clean. We see that Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 45, and also in Luke chapter 5, verses 12 through 15. Jesus healed the man, but told him not to tell others about it. Jesus may not have wanted to ignite the popular but erroneous hope that a miracle-working Messiah had come to deliver the Jews from Roman oppression, but the man began to publish it much 
insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city. And they came to him from every quarter. We see that Mark chapter 1, verse 45. That shockwave continued in today's passage. The first part of our scripture is about a packed house. Uh, once again, we're going to look at uh, Mark chapter 2, verse 1. Coming to Capernaum, okay? And it reads, And again he entered into Capernaum, where after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. Although Jesus grew up in the small town of Nazareth in Galilee, we see that Matthew chapter 2, verses 21 through 23. He had made Capernaum his base of operations when he began his public ministry in that region. We see that Mark chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Capernaum was a town on the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus had frequent interactions there. We see that Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 9, and in Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. As news spread of Jesus' presence in Capernaum, he was likely, likely at the house of Simon and his brother Andrew. Look at Mark chapter 1, verses 21 and 29. Simon's mother-in-law had been healed there and showed herself happy to offer Jesus hospitality. We see that in Mark chapter 1, verses 30 and 31. Many female disciples supported Jesus and his ministry through funds and hospitality. For example, look at Matthew 27, uh, verses 55 and 56. Simon's mother-in-law was probably one of these women, although there is no indication that she left Capernaum. That she left Capernaum. Her daughter, Simon Peter's wife, did. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5. We now come to verse 2. We see a capacity crowd. Verse 2. And it reads, And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. Partially as a consequence of a healed man spreading the news about Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, the site where archaeologists believe Peter's house had been is about 28 feet long. Evidently, the door was left open so that others could at least cram close to it and hear what was being said. Those who could do so listened to Jesus preach the word, that is, the good news regarding the impending kingdom of God and the necessity of repentance and faith. Look at uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. <clears throat> Standing room only, okay? Many years ago, a young congregation was looking for ways to raise community awareness of their small church. One of the elders, a strong-willed man, was convinced that a certain tent revival preacher could achieve this. So that man was called to do an evangelistic crusade. The evangelist was known for the somewhat circus-like atmosphere that pervaded the services held inside his big tent. The meeting got off to a small start, with about 90% of the seats empty. Undeterred, the revivalists went on local media the following day to report capacity crowds. Even though the meeting continued for two weeks, there were never any standing room, only crowds. It took the church several years to recover from the embarrassment. There was no need for false reports to get a crowd around Jesus. What happened when Jesus came to town was more spectacular than anyone imagined. But do we still tend to look to gimmicks to bring people to Christ? The second half of our scripture here, or the second part, it's about a paralyzed man. Verse 3, verses 3 and 4. An extraordinary entrance that we see here. Verse 3. And they come unto him, bringing one of the sick of palsy, which was born of four. Meanwhile, 
Four men carrying a fifth man approached the packed house. The only thing we know for sure about this man who was sick of the palsy is that he was unable to walk. He may not even have had the use of his arms. His condition could have been from birth. Compare this with Acts chapter 3 verse verse 2 and Acts chapter 14 verse 8. His condition could have been from birth as or as a result of an accident, a stroke, so on and so forth. His, the determination of the man's friends to bring him to Jesus suggests that he was in dire straits, and those who were believed Jesus could help. Now we come to verse 4. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. The action of breaking the hole in the roof isn't as destructive as it seems. Houses in Israel in Jesus' day generally had a flat roof that was accessible by a ladder or stairway. The wooden cross beams were overlaid with reeds, branches, and baked mud or clay. This thatch material had to be repacked with a stone roller every fall before the winter rains. It wouldn't have been difficult for the four for the four men to dig through the thatch and their deconstruction could be repaired with relative ease. Even so, imagine the drama of the scene. People in the house below are being sprinkled with debris. They are startled and confused. Then light begins to filter in as the hole becomes bigger. Then the light is blotted out by something being lowered through the hole. Not just something, a man on a bed. When there was no room before, certainly the crowd jostles and divides to make room for this newcomer. Likely a few steps forward to help with the lowering once they realize what is happening. Now we come to the first part. Of verse 5. And we here we see a surprising statement. First part of verse 5 reads, When Jesus saw their faith, the reason given for what Jesus said in response is their faith. The plural there is important since it includes the faith of the friends rather than just that of the afflicted man. Seeing the great lengths these men went to, Jesus realized that they believed he had the power to heal their friend. Compare this with Matthew chapter 9 verse 2 and Luke chapter 5 verse 20. What do you think? What do you think here? How can you do better at developing the kind of faith that others can see? Let's dig a little bit deeper into that question. How do you balance Matthew chapter 5 verses 14 and 16 with Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 in this regard. We now come to the second half of verse 5. He said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. What Jesus had to say in reaction to this extraordinary entrance surprises us. Wouldn't we have expected Jesus to say something like, Son, be healed. Instead, when Jesus got at the heart of most people's assumptions about illness, the Old Testament frequently, frequently assumes a direct connection between sin and sickness. God's forgiveness is often required for physical healing, and healing is often the evidence of forgiveness. For example, look at Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14, Psalm 41 verses 3 and 4, and Isaiah chapter 19 verse 22. This belief persisted into Jesus' own day. It's what led the disciples to ask regarding a blind man. Who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? We see that in the Gospel of John chapter 9 verse 2. Back to our text at hand. The sequence of events suggests 
that Jesus treated the, paral the paralysis as being the, the result of a spiritual malady. Every issue of the humanity's physical frailty can be traced in a general sense to the sin of Adam and Eve. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, and Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 19. Regardless of why the man was paralyzed, that's a discussion Jesus did not engage in with this crowd. Jesus recognized that the man's greater need was to be forgiven for his sins. We now come to our third section. There's some cynical bystanders in the crowd here. We come to the first part of verse 6. Silent skepticism. First part, the first part of verse 6 reads, But there were certain of the scribes sitting there. The scribes were educated, both in God's written law and its oral interpretation. By proportion, Mark mentions that the most frequently of the four Gospels, but only one time, is one of them depicted in other than a negative light. Look at Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. Sitting was often a posture of teaching, would suggest that these scribes were anticipating more of a debate with Jesus than being taught by Jesus. Also look at uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 17. Hey, excuse me for a minute here, I need to get a drink. <clears throat> Now we come to the second part of verse 6 and verse 7. And it reads, And reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Mark does not describe the reaction of the paralyzed man, his friends, or the larger crowd, to Jesus' surprising statement, but only the unspoken skepticism of the scribes. Priests could offer sacrifices for forgiveness of sin, for forgiveness of sins on behalf of those who took the proper steps of repentance. For example, look at Leviticus chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. The scribes were well aware that the Old Testament taught that no one can forgive sins but God only. Look at Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 through 9, Psalm 130, verses 2, 3, and 4, and Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25. But Jesus spoke as though he had the same power to forgive sins as God. If the scholars even consider whether Jesus could be God, they would have rejected the idea out of hand. There was no precedent for God becoming man. The scribes were therefore left to conclude that Jesus was speaking blasphemies. They viewed Jesus' presumption to forgive sins as an arrogant offense to the authority and majesty of God. The law of Moses pronounced the penalty for blasphemy to be death by stoning. Look at Leviticus chapter 24, verses 10 through 16, and Numbers chapter 15, verses 30 and 31. That will indeed be attempted later, but not on this occasion. Look at the Gospel of John chapter 10, verses 31 through 33. What do you think? What do you think here? What are some ways to guard against jealousy when someone else's ministry results in attention and honor that you do not share. Let's dig a little bit deeper. In addition to, look at Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. What passages help you most to answer this? A Reformed Cynic. Let's talk about a Reformed Cynic for a moment here. Every Bible professor has to deal with the occasional student who knows it all. One such student, let's call him Jim, started the semester with a perpetual smirk on his face. His body language let his classmates know that whatever was said was already old stuff to him. If Jim disagreed with the professor, he would look around with that smirk. I don't know what eventually shattered his sense of pride, but Jim changed during that semester. 
By the end of the school year, he had accepted a ministry position at a community where many citizens were cynical about the Christian faith. Jen seemed to know what drove their cynicism. He was able to counter that attitude, and the church began to grow. The cynics in Jesus' audience were know-it-alls. Unlike Jim, they persisted in refusing to learn. Even when the Messiah was their teacher, who are you more like, the skeptics in the text who never learned, or Jim, who grew in humility? We now come to the first part of verse 8 and verse 9. Perceptive judgment. First, the first part of verse 8 reads, And immediately when Jim perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, we can be confident that Jesus' judgment here went beyond merely reading the body language of the scriptures. Of the skeptics. Scripture, scripture clearly affirms God's ability to know people's hearts. Look at Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 10, Acts chapter 1 verse 24, and Acts chapter 15 verse 8. The second part of verse 8 and verse 9 read this. He said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk. Jesus met the scribes' unspoken disapproval with questions of his own. The use of counter-questions was common in rabbinic debate and employed frequently by Jesus. For example, look at Mark chapter 11, verses 27 through 33. Here, Jesus' counter-question challenged the skeptic's belief that Jesus had offered the man something that wasn't in his power to give, and it paved the way for Jesus' upcoming declaration of physical healing. It is easier to declare forgiveness than to tell a paralyzed man to walk, since the former can't be objectively verified and the latter has physical proof. But the declaration of forgiveness is more essential and difficult. Most likely, Jesus was emphasizing that both declarations and impossible are impossible for human beings and easy for God. Let me say that again. Jesus was emphasizing that both declarations are impossible for human beings and easy for God. We now come to the fourth part of our scripture, an amazing miracle. Absolute authority, verses 10 and 11. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. In this climatic pronouncement, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. This rather mysterious title seems to have its origin in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, which states that God would bestow on this heavenly figure dominion and glory in the end times. Son of Man was a favorite self-designation Jesus used. The phrase occurs some 80 times in the Gospels and only on one occasion on the lips of anyone other than Jesus. Look at the Gospel of John chapter 12, verse 34. The ambiguity of the title spirited from preconceived ideas in Jesus' name. Therefore, he was able to infuse it with his own definition in the Gospels. This Messianic title is connected with the nature of Jesus' person and word, who he is and what he does. In addition to having authority to forgive sins, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Look at Mark chapter 2, verse 28. The Son of Man is the Lord of, Sabbath, of the Sabbath, who came to give his life as a ransom. Look at the Mark chapter 10, verse 45. And rise from the dead. Look at Mark chapter 8, verse 31. Mark chapter 10, verses 33 and 34. He is the one who will one day come in the clouds and with great power and glory. Look at Mark chapter 13, verse 26 
and also Mac, Mark chapter 14, verse 62. Jesus was able and willing to show the scribes and everyone else that he had power on earth to forgive sins, although there is a technical distinction between power and authority. Power is the ability to do something, and authority is the right to do something. Look at Luke chapter 4, verse 36, and uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Mark doesn't make a sharp distinction. Jesus has both, and that is the crux of this story. His ability to heal physically was tangible proof of ability to heal spiritually by forgiving sins. After Jesus addressed the scribes in particular, and perhaps the crowd in general, he shifted focus to the paralyzed man. If the man could obey Jesus' command to arise, it would be evidence that Jesus was capable of miraculous healing. The man's obedience would also imply that Jesus' earlier pronouncement of forgiveness was as effective as his pronouncement of healing. We now come to the first part of verse 12. And it reads, And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all. To put it simply, the man believed and obeyed, as there could be no evidence of the man's forgiveness without the healing. There could be no evidence of his faith without his obedience. The bed was likely rolled and carried. Now we come to the second part of verse 12. Glorifying God. Insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Mark speaks of people's being amazed several times in this gospel to describe reaction to what Jesus said with authority and or did as miraculous. The evidence Jesus offered affirmed that his declaration of forgiveness was legitimate. This event was startling evidence that the, that the kingdom of God was indeed at hand. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 15. We might think Mark's statement that all glorified God is overstated. Surely, surely the, the scribes were not included, but they too had to acknowledge the miracle, whether or not they believed that forgiveness had been granted for them to glorify God wouldn't necessarily mean that they thank God for sending Jesus. The scribes, along with everyone else, simply had never seen events after this fashion. Now we come to our conclusion of this uh, lesson. A different diagnosis. Today's lesson reminds us of the spiritual components involved in genuine and integrated health and healing. Whether Jesus diagnosed this man's paralysis as being a result of sin, the man certainly couldn't be made whole without spiritual healing. No significant and permanent healing can occur apart from reconciliation with God. As we have seen, God alone forgives sins, and God alone is the source of healing. Jesus still has the power and authority to provide healing by bringing release from the crippling burden of sin. As God in the flesh, Jesus Christ was the incarnation of the profound statement recorded in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. I am the Lord that healeth thee. This is not always seen and physical healing of maladies in this current life on earth, but it will absolutely be seen in the resurrection bodies that grow from the seed of our present bodies. So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 through 54. This story also reminds us of how much we need our fellow brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Although we probably won't need them to carry us on a stretcher to church or a prayer meeting, we do need to bear one another's burdens. That's uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. And there are times when we need to heed and practice the, ins the instruction of James chapter 5, verse 16. And that reads, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. As you reflect on Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, 
and consider how it applies to your life. Write a prayer that brings before the Lord your various needs. Lay out your physical, spiritual, emotional, relational, and material needs and your questions about them. Call on the absolute authority of Jesus Christ to make you whole so that you can better glorify, honor, and serve him. We're going to close out here with a short prayer and a song. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize that you have power and authority both to forgive sins and to heal sickness. We present to you every aspect of our lives. May we love you with all of our hearts, souls, minds, and strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we close out here, leave you with this thought to remember. Jesus still has absolute authority and power to both forgive and to heal. Folks, stay safe, be blessed, stay in the Word, and write the Word upon your heart. Until next time. Amen.